All right, hey everyone. How are you today? So I think I saw Rick, I think that you I saw that you were on earlier. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me just fine. All right, so cool. Uh, hey, John. Hey, hey, Jeff. Uh, hey, Rick. Um, and uh, and those of you who haven't checked in uh, on the chat to say hi, we're gonna go ahead and we are going to get started. So what we're gonna tie today is a Hawaiian bonefish fly. Um, now I said Hawaiian shrimp fly, but the reality is, is that this is what, um, you know, I, I had a good fortune. My work took me out to Hawaii. I said, hey, I probably will never get back. So let me go ahead and take advantage of this and go ahead and, um, you know, hire a guide and go out and see what we can catch. And we used this little fly right here. Let me hold it differently so you can see it. Real shrimpy. This is the original fly, um, and uh, we caught you know, a little baby giant trevally off of it. Um, we caught uh, some bonefish off of it, some trumpet fish. So it, it did a really good job out there. I said, "Hey, that's a really really cool pattern." And you know, fortunately enough, the guide let me take it home. Some guides will let you take their flies. Some guys guides won't. Um, and so with this particular one, I said, "That's fantastic," but I have no idea how to tie it. So I took it into a local fly shop. And we kind of dissected it and said, okay, well, what do we need to do to get as close as we can? And uh, what we came up with was this. So we hold these side by side with the original. And then with what we, we've kind of come up with, we came close. It's not perfect. Um, however, this fly, while a, a Hawaiian you know, origin uh, fly. It, I've used it all over Virginia and I've caught creek chubs um, in the rivers. I've caught, uh, let's see here, flounder down in the um, eastern shore along the ocean. I've caught uh, a redfish. Uh, redfish was definitely hooked up on it. We, we lost it, came about 20 feet from the boat. And that was in um, last year's Legends of the Fly tournament down in Virginia Beach. Uh, and then, um, you know, th this fly has also taken, I want to say, sea trout as well. Uh, so it's something that's incredibly versatile. And, and the reason why is it just looks like a little crayfish pattern. And so, oh, awesome, Rick. Congratulations. That is a lot of nice bonefish that you caught. So, um, wow, did you get one of the permits yourself? If so, that that's an, an you know an, an awesome achievement. So, but yeah, so the, you know basically what we find is, is that little crustacean patterns just work well. So it's a it's a fun thing to tie and to throw. Um, you can throw it in you know still water in freshwater streams and creeks, um, and you know obviously take it down saltwater fishing and, and have a blast with it as well. So for this pattern. What we want to do is we want to tie with a, a smaller hook um, than, than what we typically would. So my favorite hook that I like to use is this right here. This is a, a Gamagatsu SC15. Um, this is actually a size one odd. This is designed for uh, saltwater flats. Um, however, if you don't have this hook, and it's a little bit more of a specialty hook, you know, honestly, a size 6 B10S will work just fine. In fact, this is tied on a size 6 B10S. Um, this one here is tied on that specialty saltwater hook that I showed you, that SC15. Um, and then obviously the original was tied on something kind of in between, and I'm not 100% certain what this hook was. Um, so this is kind of an example of, hey, I see a really cool fly, 
how do I dissect that fly and get as close as I can to it so then I can use that uh, for my own purposes in the future. So, all right, so let me go ahead and put my hook in my vise. Oops, dropped it. Yeah, I just saw your comment, Jeff, and uh, and yeah, I was just thinking of that particular person as well, who um, used to, you know, some guys that I talked about uh, before. My guide was was generous enough to let me take the fly with me, um, but uh, some guides are so secretive that they will actually not let the client see it. They'll say, oh, give me your line, I'll tie it on, I'm gonna throw it in the water, okay, now cast it, all right, every fish that you catch, I'm gonna take it off the hook, and at the end of the day, they snip it off. So you never really get a chance to, to look at that fly pattern. Uh, some guides are very, very secretive, uh, so it's always interesting, you know, depending on the, the guide that you're gonna get. All right, um, so we've got our hook in our vise, and let's go over a couple of the materials that you're gonna need in advance. And I know I kind of put this in the, in the window, but um, I'll, I'll show this to you now. Uh, so we have a, a dumbbell eye. This is like a large dumbbell eye. Um, want something to give it weight to get down to the bottom. This is meant to be fished just off the bottom. <clears throat> yep, yep, Steve, Nervous Waters. That's exactly who I used. And uh, yep, it's a fantastic fly. Um, so uh, for my thread, I, I'm using a UTC 140. Um, so it's got plenty of strength, but it's also thin. And so um, go ahead and I'm gonna use this. Start threading up. So in addition to the dumbbell eye, which we're gonna put on here in just a minute, uh, we're gonna need some flash. And so flash on this fly is interesting. So I'm gonna use some orange crinkle flash for the tail end of the fly. And at the very head of the fly, I'm gonna use a little bit of this floral fiber. Now this is entirely optional. This was not on the original pattern. This is something that I think makes the fly look a little bit better, personally. Um, but this is totally optional, and all this is is super, super fine. It's kind of hard to see, super fine um, uh, flash material. So if you don't have anything like this, don't worry about it. Um, but if you do, hey, this is you know something that you can, you can add on. Um, we're also gonna need some legs. And so I'm gonna be using some real thin legs. This is a, uh, a micro crusher legs. Again, any rubber leg will work just fine. Um, and you know, I've personally tied them with a regular thick rubber leg, you know, looks something like that, um, works well. Um, but the original has, you know, these real thin rubber legs on them. So we're gonna try to get as close to it as we can. Uh, and the last thing that we need is a, a um, well, two things. Uh, we're gonna need some orange bucktail. Um, and then we're also gonna need some type of body wrap. And so we're not sure what the original body wrap was, but we can get pretty close to it by using this dyed UV polar chenille. If you don't have any body wrap, I wouldn't worry too much. Um, you can actually tie this without the body wrap and tie it like a crazy Charlie and it'll be fine uh, and work extremely well. Um, oh, that's funny. Yeah, shad patterns would totally work too for, uh, for bonefish. And I love, I love that, you know, they asked it for uh, for a template so that they could use it as well. It's always funny what works, what doesn't work. Sometimes it just needs to be something unique that the fish haven't seen before. So, uh, but yeah, so the body wrap material, uh, this uh, you know UV polar chenille works really well. I'm always looking for better materials for this fly. So if you're looking at it and you say, hey, wait a second, what if I use this? Try it, see if it works. This is you know about trying to recreate a fly, but also trying to make one that's tailored to the way you want. You know, we're given homage to the fact that, you know, this was a guide fly from, you know, from Nervous Waters, specifically from uh, Hawaii, and it's great. Um, and we're gonna do as close as we can, because obviously they're probably using materials that we just can't get in our local shops. All right, so let's get, get down to it. Uh, so we got our hook here, we're laying down our thread base. Now, unlike most of the time when we put on dumbbell eye, when we put it on up near the eye of the hook, we're actually putting this dumbbell on as far back on the hook as we can, which seems really kind of counterintuitive. But what it ends up resulting in is a fly that'll sit like that. Um, so it's kind of neat. So if you're stripping along and you stop, 
they'll actually just rest on the bottom. And you really shouldn't bounce it on our bottoms unless you're fishing a saltwater flat with nice hard sandy bottom or on a, a stream or something like that in a, in a slow pool. Um, but that's the way that it is designed. So when I look at my hook profile, I have my flat hook shank right to about here is where it starts to curve down. So I'm putting my thread all the way back to that point and then I'm going to advance it slightly forward to about here and I'm going to go ahead and put in that thread bump. And this is what we do for a lot of our dumbbell eyes, right? This is true for Clouser, no matter what it is, half and half. We put a little thread bump and that helps lock those eyes in place. All right, uh, so next thing I want to do is, um, and again, this is optional. This is something that I, I like to do with my eyes. Not everyone does this. Take one little drop of super glue, put it right where I'm going to put that dumbbell eye onto the actual hook shank. And then I like to take the thread and do one wrap around that dumbbell and pull it right down into place. And then we'll do a series of wraps in one direction, diagonally, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Results in the eyes being completely skewed. But now what we're going to do is we're going to come the other way and we're going to start pulling. And I'll, I usually pull with both fingers and just twist it. Um, I'll try not doing that this time just so that you can kind of see. I might have to tweak it a little bit. So with each wrap, I'm just putting pressure on it and just twisting it. And with each successive wrap, it's slowly pulling the eyes back straight. And you might say, well, why don't I just, you know, crisscross the eyes? I've tried that. And I have to say that this just results in the eyes being locked in uh, so much more secure. And they just don't spin after going through and doing this. And they're under a lot more tension as well. So that right about there is good. I'll pop my spring back into place. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead. I like to put one wrap forward, then come back one wrap. And then I'm going underneath, up, down, underneath. And I'm just doing that about you know, five or six times. And now the, these eyes are on rock steady. Now you may want to go back and take a look and make sure that they're secured in place because that's super glue. Once it sets, these eyes don't move. Okay, so I've got the eyes in place. Now what I'm going to do, and this is very few flies that I've ever tied uh, do this. Um, the Clawdad being one of the exceptions. Um, but what we're going to do is start to take our thread down the bend of the hook. We see this a lot in trout flies to give natural curvature, but we don't see it as much in streamers. Uh, now, I'm not coming far, mind you. I'm only coming down, you know, maybe a quarter of an inch down this hook shank. So, you know, just enough so that uh, we, we've got a little bit of that curvature in place. And now I'm going to go ahead and bring my thread back up to those eyes. So now we're ready to put in our orange crinkle flash. <clears throat> so let's see here, let's grab this material. There we go. So how many strands do I typically use? Um, for this, I'm usually using about three. And when I say a strand, and I've done this before, it's only about half the length of the pack. I never pull out from the, um, the zip tie. That way the materials stay nice and secured. So go ahead and grab these. Cut those off. By the way, the way that I, um, I don't think I've ever shown this before, so this is kind of nice for material management. When I uh, have a pack of flash, I will cut both ends off. It allows me to pull the, the flash out, and then also to push the flash back in. Uh, it's a really easy way for me to make sure that the flash stays together, um, that it doesn't start getting all, all messed up and, and crinkled up. Everyone has their own ways for material management. Some people actually have a pegboard, have all their flash hanging on it. Uh, I, I prefer to do it this way, and then I, I have everything in, in Ziploc bags. Um, so, you know, if you've been uh, struggling to keep your materials together, give that a try and, and see how it goes. Okay, um, so let me find my flash. Here it is. I've got my three strands of flash, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and fold this in half once to turn three strands into six strands, just like that. It gives me a loop. 
I'll cut the loop. So now I've got uh, a lot more flash material. I'm gonna go ahead and tie this in. So I'm gonna find that logical halfway point. If you don't know where the halfway point is, kind of fold it, find it. Um, but I can kind of eyeball it and look it. And um, <laughs> so, so somebody noticed that I had a, a WebEx tone chime off. Uh, yeah, there is a, a meeting for my company in about 15 minutes, but I do not have to be on it. So don't worry, guys. You have my undivided attention. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and okay, let me explain what I did. I got distracted there. Uh, all right. So I went ahead and I started the tie in the tie in point and I, I wrapped down about maybe three wraps. This separates the bundle in half. So now I can take this bundle and bend it over the other side of the hook and this, you'll be able to see this better and um, start wrapping on it as well. So what my goal is, is to have a little bit of separation in this flash so it's not all together. If, if you struggle with that, just tie it all as one bundle. Don't worry about it. Um, I happen to like it being separated. It almost looks like little claws or something like that. Um, you know, this is shrimp pattern. Shrimp really don't have claws, but um, except the mantis shrimp. You don't know what a mantis shrimp is? Google it and look at it because it is cool. But, uh, you know, anyway, I, I just happen to like the look when you have that separation, but it's not required. And so I'm just wrapping down until I get to the end of that tie in point. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to keep my thread there and I'm going to pull out my cactus chenille. Um, or, uh, sorry, this is polar chenille, not cactus chenille. You could tie this with cactus chenille. I'm sure it would work. Um, cactus chenille doesn't have as long of fibers. But, uh, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and tie this in place as well. And I'm just going to do a couple of loose wraps just to make sure I have it secure. And then I'm going to start doing tighter wraps and really secure this material in place. So now that I have this chenille tied, I'm going to go ahead and advance my thread all the way up to the hook eye. And um, if, you, if you want and you have a... Uh, Bobbin holder, go ahead and take advantage of it. I have to adjust mine um, just so it gets material out of the way. Uh, if you are going to do this, though, always make sure to put a half hitch in first, or you actually potentially could unwind your thread. Um, so I'm putting a half hitch in place, tightening that up, and, and now that's out of the way, and I can actually wrap. Um, without having to worry about fighting the, the thread. If you don't, don't worry. Uh, you just, you know, take your time as you, you go around. Um, so we're going to go ahead and just start wrapping. Now, as I wrap, just like with uh, many other things that when this is actually palmering is the technique, I want to make sure that these fibers aren't getting trapped. So as I go around, I'll take the time to kind of grab those fibers and pull them out of the way and continue to wrap. And I'm just laying one wrap next to another, coming all the way around. Um, by the way, I don't like to put my chenille over top the eye. You can. Um, totally fine to do it that way if you want. Not a big deal. I just don't like to put it there. Uh, just so that the um, uh, material doesn't build up around that eye. That's personal preference. Doesn't, doesn't really matter too hard. Okay, so I'm just making sure that I've got the material back as I wrap forward. So I'm not trapping those fibers. Man, this thing is looking crazy and buggy and exactly how I want it to. Uh, we're going to do some trimming of this material when we're finished so that it looks less like a fuzzy ball and more like a shrimp. So we're just taking our time, taking our material, pulling it back, slowly moving forward until we get about to that point. You know, this is almost about where you would normally tie in a set of dumbbell eyes. Um, so I'm going to stop here, grab my thread. I've shown this trick before. So right now I'm, I'm having to hold the chenille in place while I'm manipulating my thread. If I want to be able to let go of my chenille, if I had them out, I could take a pair of hackle pliers and hang them off. Which, fortunately, we're just behind me. So if I take my hackle pliers, lock them on, I can let go. Um, so that's, that's a nice trick. If, uh, if you're ever struggling with material, um, this works really well on trout flies with hackle and things like that. 
So, you know, just like any other material, when I go to secure this in, wrap in behind, wrap forward, wrap behind, wrap forward. After I've done that twice, that kind of figure eight around it, uh, I know that that material is locked in place. So I'm gonna go ahead, cut it off. Always separate your thread from your material that you're cutting so you don't cut your thread. And then I like to pull the material back and wrap back a little bit over top too to really make sure that this is locked down into place. This fly is gonna take a lot of abuse. Any fly that's designed to fish just off the bottom, it's gonna be bouncing on that bottom, whether it be a sand flat, whether it be rocks, uh, you name it. it it's really gonna cause a lot of abrasion against this part of the fly. So we're gonna, um, I'll show you some steps to, to help make this fly more durable. Um, but also, that's one of the reasons why I really like to lock that down. So, Let's start doing uh, a little bit of trimming. Now I do some trimming at this point because there's so much of this material sitting on what it was actually gonna be the bottom of the hook um, that we don't really want there. So I'm just gonna kind of grab a clump of it and I'm just trying to separate everything out and say, okay, this is the stuff on the bottom and I'm gonna trim just off that hook shank and start pulling that material off. So I'm just giving it a close haircut up to the hook eye. I don't really trim much beyond that hook eye, or not hook eye, I'm sorry, uh, the dumbbell eyes. So I just kind of trim it right along here. Uh, and I'm only trimming these fibers. I am not trimming this, um, this kind of yarn, uh, the actual spine, if you will, of that, that polar chenille. Um, I'll even come in a little bit on the sides and just give a little bit of a trim, just so it has a more slender profile overall. And the last thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the hook over, kind of pull these fibers back. It's starting to look shrimpier. And I'm going to take my scissors at an angle and just try to trim some of these fibers in front. This gives us a little natural ramp and gets some of um, these materials out of the way for uh, our last two material that we're going to tie onto this fly. So our next material that we're going to use is going to be our bucktail and, and my orange bucktail is getting real, uh, real sparse at the moment, but uh, we want to tie as, so I, I've talked about this before, but uh, it's worth repeating. One, you notice I'm trying to tie a uh, cut material from the tip all the way down the sides. Um, so, you know, I haven't gotten as perfect as I, I could to uh, make it where you only see that, uh, the darker, dark orange on the back, um, but I'm, I'm trying to do it as best as I can. Uh, now the, the bucktail itself is, is really in um, a couple types of variation when, when you get one. Up here towards the very tip and all the way down to about, usually about here on the bucktail, um, it is closed hair and so it's not going to flare on you or spin uh, very easily. Down here at the very tail end, however, this bucktail is more hollow and so if you tie with it, you'll actually uh, see it flare more and it'll actually spin on you a little bit. So I've used that to my advantage on like a musky fly or something like that where I'm making like a Buford head. Uh, I'll actually grab that type of, uh, that part of the bucktail to do that. Um, but I still have plenty of bucktail up here in the section that, that's closed hair. So just, you know, a little bit of knowledge around bucktails themselves and, and you know, the different ways that the um, hair is going to react depending upon where you grab it. So I'm not taking much. I'm taking, I don't know what this is. Um, that's not, it's not even close to a pencil. Uh, maybe uh, a pencil point worth, two pencil points worth of hair when you really squeeze it and pull it tight. So just a very, very small amount. Cut that as close as I can to the hide, put that off to the side. So now I have this clump of hair. I want to remove the shorts. So I'm going to grab about halfway up, take these short fibers out. And so now I've got hair that is mostly uh, together. You know, I got some that are, are longer and some that are, are medium in length. 
So I'm actually gonna grab the longer tip. So I'm gonna uh, hand stack. So uh, if I pull those carefully, I can restack them together and retaper this bundle. And I'm gonna do it one more time. So now by hand stacking, I get a more uh, tapered but even um, clump. And I wanna make sure that I have, I'll show you the measurement that I'm gonna do. So you see these uh, kind of fibers coming off the back here. These are our, our crystal hair. I want those to be about the same length as my bucktail. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna measure that. I'm gonna say, yep, that's about right. Know where that measurement is, come down along the hook. And I'm gonna snip this right here. And I'm gonna use, off camera, I got a little recycling bin or a trash can. So I'm gonna use that. So I've got that cut. I'm staying down at an angle. So by tying at an angle, this is going to result in hair that stays at an angle, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm going to keep the bundle of hair at an angle and go ahead and take, I've got a couple fibers that want to get in my way in tying, so I know how to fix that. I'll just cut it out of the way. Um, I'm going to go ahead and with a loose wrap and then pull up, loose wrap, pull up. Now I can start securing this bundle in all the way back to that tie-in point, right about there. So now when I let go, you see how that hair still stays at an angle? That's by the way, um, other bonefish flies, like a crazy Charlie, that's how they achieve that as well. Um, by tying in at an angle, you get that, that kind of neat little ramp. Uh, a lot of different saltwater flats flies are tied with that that style so it's a good thing to practice and learn so where we're at right now is i think a a perfectly acceptable point for a fly if you don't have rubber legs and you don't have this little floral fiber uh, you can totally you know tie the fly off do a little bit more trimming that we'll do at the end and have a very fishable pattern uh, for myself, I like adding those extra two pieces. I like adding the legs and I like adding that floral fiber. So I'm going to go ahead and, and do that now. Um, and I like to add the floral fiber next. So this stuff, if you ever get, you know, this kind of like micro flash, it is super uh, crazy to deal with and, and real staticky. So to deal with this flash, what I've done is I've actually cut a corner of the bag off. And that allows me, I can actually come in with my... Um, with finishing tool and grab some of these hairs out and pull that bundle out if I need to. Uh, and then once I have a small loop, then I can come with my fingers and I can I can pull out the, the rest of it. So I'm gonna grab, I don't know, maybe a dozen of these little fibers. Um, very, very small amount, because we're gonna double this up, so we don't want too much. Um, so, you know, I like, you know, maybe about that much. Go ahead and trim this. Again, as close as I can. And now I've got just a, a wisp of flash. And when you pull it tight, it just looks almost like as thick as my thread. Maybe a little thicker than 140, closer to like a, a Kevlar gel spun thread. So I'm gonna advance my thread, not all the way to the hook eye, um, just a little bit behind it. Take my flash underneath, bend it around, and then pull down on that thread to lock in that flash. And then I'm gonna take and also hold it at an angle while I go ahead and tie in to that same point where I tied in that bucktail. And that's gonna sit just on top of it and I can advance my thread forward. Be good. Now the reason why I did not go all the way up to the hook eye, because any time, and this is gonna be really hard to see, um, we're working on making these live streams better. Uh, hopefully the quality of this is pretty good for you guys, but we're trying to make it so that we can tie these smaller flies and, and you you guys can actually see them. But if, if you do that technique where you fold the flash over and you pull it into place, what you'll notice is a little bump will occur. So if I have that bump back here, which is where it is on, on uh, my fly, then I have this section here in front where I can go ahead with the thread and come back and make a little thread ramp and make that nice and smooth. 
Um, but if you don't, and you put it right up by the hook eye, you'll tend to get a really big thread bump right up here. Fish will not notice, not care, not a big deal. This is all more to catch the fisherman than it is for the fish. Um, but just a, a tip to make a, a cleaner um, head on your fly and, and a neater finish. Okay, so the last thing that we need to do is to put on our rubber legs. And so, you know, again, I'm using these kind of uh, micro thin legs. If you want to use regular rubber legs, it'll be just fine. In fact, like I said, I, I've, you know, that's how I started tying until I found the real thin legs and this this caught plenty of fish. I mean, I've caught flounder on this fly, um, this this one in my hand. I've caught, uh, I think this is the one that caught that creek chub. It's about 18 inches long, too. It was massive. Uh, so, yeah, Steve, this definitely will work as a carp fly. It is a little on the bright side. Um, so, obviously, we're tying this orange, right? And with this because that is the, the original color that I received. Um, and I think it's a great color. But you could... Uh, tie it with darker materials if you want. <clears throat> so yeah, yeah, Jeff saying it's probably spooked them. Well, Jeff, why don't you give us uh, your advice? You know, what do you think? If we tied this in a, a darker color, like a muddier color, a brown or something like that, you think it would work? You think it would just be the, the color or are you worried about the weight of these eyes causing too much disturbance in the water? All right, so all I'm doing is just cutting off the leg from both sides. And I'm only going to use one strand because uh, it's plenty long, plenty long enough for what I'm doing. And so now I'm going to go ahead and uh, I want this to be where, like, if I take this material and I pull this material back, and I want that leg to be close to about that same length. So I'll kind of hold that so you can see. You know, it's about that same length. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and hold that in place. And then I'm going to take my thread and with one wrap, capture that material. And it's on the side of the hook. So you see what I did there? I'm, I'm only doing loose wraps at the moment. And it still allows me to move this material around. And I can slide it forward and back if I need to. Yeah, that's a really good idea, Jeff, with the bead chain. I think that that's something that uh, could work well. So now that I have a couple wraps around it, I can go ahead and put in a couple of tighter wraps, and that material is locked in place. But I haven't put too many wraps forward and back because I want to keep down the amount of wraps I'm putting at the head of this fly because you can get uh, really... Um, thick up at the front end. Uh, so just, you know, just to make it look cleaner. Now I'm going to take the rest of this and I'm going to pull it a little tighter and put a wrap over it. And all I'm doing is making it so that this stays along the side of the hook. So I'm going to invert this back over because it's easier to tie these legs on this way. I'm going to hold both of the legs together and wrap these legs in place and clean up the head of this fly. So you know I've never thought about making this a weedless fly. In general I, I really hate tying a weedless fly because I, I hate tying the weed guard. Um, should could you try this weedless? Absolutely. Would it work weedless? It'd probably be fantastic, especially for some of our palms and everything like that. Um, it's certainly something that I think is, is worth trying. Uh, you know, Jeff, you know, give it a, give it a go and then um, share your results on it because I, I'm curious. How I would tie this weedless? So I have, in my flying tying desk, I have some hard mono. And so what you would do is take some of this hard mono, pull it out. Oops, there we go. And um, you could do it with one strand or you could do it with two. Um, I would need to cut this. And then you would tie that hard mono into place. And uh, typically I've seen it done with two strands. So you kind of, you could, um, you just kind of crimp it in a V. You know what, fine, we'll, we'll go ahead for Jeff. 
We will we will uh, attempt a weedless version of this fly. So I am folding this in half, cutting it. We'll do a final trim afterwards. Um, and if I'm going to go weedless, I'm going to go about to the halfway point. Bring this up, hold it in center, put a wrap in front. You can tell here, we, weed guards are, are not simple. Really squeeze that in place, come back. And this is so thick. Nope. All right. Let me get this. All right. There it is. I finally trapped it. I don't recommend you do this. <laughs> Just because I hate tying weedless. Um, and I don't think it needs to. But hey, you know, this is how you would do it. And let me just go ahead and just plenty of wraps in place to hold this in place. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and finish this off. Notice it added so much more uh, material into the front of it. And uh, we're going to go ahead and whip finish this off now. I'm going to have to bend that um, weed guard a little bit too to really get that into place. By the way, if, if we didn't just, you know, on the fly decide, hey, we're going to tie this thing weedless, uh, then you would have whip finished after finish tying in those legs. So, yeah, let me know, guys. Um, was that visible with the mono? You know, Jeff's exactly right. One of the reasons why we haven't done weedless yet is we were super concerned that you wouldn't be able to see it. So let me go ahead and squish down, grab that mono. I'm really going to bend this forward. So we're really looking to keep it in front of that hook point. See, that's how it should be. Now, it's way too long. So now what we're going to do is take it right to about where that hook point is, or just in front of that hook point. Careful not to mess your scissors up and give it a cut. So now let's see if that shows up. You can see that's that's how you would do weedless, but when the fish grabs it, it bends down. And, and you constantly have to, I'm in no way an expert on weedless. Um, but you do constantly kind of have to be mindful of it and, and bend it out sometimes if you want. Some people will actually tie it where they're literally straight up um, and it still works. Um, you know, I kind of just like bending it where they're, they're kind of like that. All right. So let's go back to, uh, oh, this is, um, Jonathan, this is hard mono and this is 20 pound test. The, uh, the key to this is diameter. So this is a 0.021 inch diameter. So it's a thicker diameter. Uh, I actually use this for making shrimp eyes an awful lot. Um, so cool, I'm glad you guys were able to see it. So actually, we'll do this just over here. If you take this hard mono as well, and you let that cool, don't touch that, molten plastic burns then uh, you have created a shrimp eye. And so if you take this thing and, it's a patent pending way to open up a Sharpie marker, you can actually come in and color it. And now we have a black shrimp eye. Yeah, and so um, to make it so that Sharpie marker doesn't uh, rub off, you just dip this into a little bit of high gloss head cement. And, uh, and that also makes it a little bit thicker, a little bit shinier. And then um, you'll have a, a very kind of durable uh, little hard mono eye. So, you know, that's actually why I usually keep this at my tying desk rather than for, for tying weedless. But now you, you can see the versatility. Okay. Um, so real quick, let's finish up this fly. Uh, we've gone on enough tangents. So all I'm doing is, is holding the two rubber legs together and giving them a trim. So they're about the same length. I'm going to check my length. Yep, that looks about right that I want. 
I'm going to go ahead and take my fly, flip it back over, come back in, um, give another trim for some of these fibers that have gotten real spindly. If you um, need to comb out, this is an old toothbrush, works beautifully for a number of flies. Uh, you can comb everything out, and then I'll, I'll come in and kind of give another haircut because some of these, these fibers have now been teased into their natural place. And um, that's looking looking great. So when you first tie this fly, it looks a little crazy and unruly, right? Um, but as it gets wet, it pulls to a really nice shrimp profile. And over time, when you fish it, so let me pull out one that I, I fished a bunch. Um, it starts to, well, this one got messed up. So let me pull out this guy. It eventually will start to pull everything together and straighten out. But it gives it lots of body. So see, because shrimp aren't tiny, they're, they're thick, um, but they're generally thicker in one diam uh, dimension than they are in the other. So, you know, we get this, this thicker dimension here and a little bit of a thinner dimension here, but also some movement and some wiggliness. And um, I don't know, it, it, it just works for me. Uh, so let's talk about ways that now that I've, I've kind of taken this fly and I've tied it up. Let's talk about ways that I can make this fly a little bit more durable because I, I promised you to, to do that and I'm still going to trim. Some of these fibers are just too unruly for even my, my liking. Go ahead and pull those down, trim those. How do I make this fly more durable? Well, I'm going to look at, and this is for any fly, uh, high abrasion points where I'm going to be rubbing against sand or something like that. And that's going to be right along this bottom, right? Because remember, with my eyes, it's going to invert and it's actually going to swim this way. So, go ahead and open up my head cement. And I'll use a bodkin for this. Dip it in, just get a, a drop of head cement on. And uh, I'm going to start up here first. I'm going to do these, these front thread wraps because that's a high abrasion point. Make sure I've got good coverage. Um, this tends to soak into the thread real well. And then I'm going to take another drop and start working it along the back end of this hook. So this is going to really help this fly to hold up against sand, against gravel, uh, you know, high, high wear points so that over time it doesn't come frayed. And I always put a drop of head cement right here on top, on the back of the um, dumbbell eyes to protect those thread wraps. Because if you don't, that's a high abrasion point and that will eventually wear out and, uh, and your thread will start to come loose. And then the last part I like to do is kind of holding all this material down and together. This also helps hold it into shape is put some of this head cement right here on that bend of that hook helps keep that clump together as well. Um, well, I've, I want to say I've caught um, a Jack Crivelli on this fly too. It's a very, very versatile pattern, especially for salt water. Now I'm gonna go ahead and flip this fly over so everything continues. I just like to rotate a little when I put head cement on. Um, now I was silly, I've got head cement in the eye of the hook. Uh, so what do I do? Well, I've shown you guys this before, when we were uh, working with um, like hackle feathers, but I have a little bit of this rubber leg left over. See, nope, that's too thin. So instead, let me grab a piece of that mono. That's gonna work perfect. All right, I can't find it. So let's grab a piece. All right, so if I stick that into that hook eye, that really helps clear it out. I'll do that a few times. Make sure that the eye of that hook stays clear. There's, in my opinion, almost no reason for flies you've tied yourself to worry about having to have a hook eye cleaner 
while you're stream side, you know, while you're you're on the flats or on your boat or at the lake, because uh, you should take care of that at the vise when you tie your fly, uh, so that it's ready to go the moment that you want to tie it on. Because nothing's worse than grabbing your fly, trying to tie it on, and realizing um, you didn't take the time to take a look at the hook eye, and and now you got to do surgery stream side to make sure that you can actually tie your fly onto your hook so you can go after and catch that fish. All right, so that's that's basically all there is to this fly. It's not super uh, challenging. If you if you don't do this this uh, weed guard, it takes a lot less time. Um, and then you know you can also skip doing that that last bit of um, either the legs or that uh, floral fiber, and uh, and really have a fly that you can crank out in just a few minutes, right? Just tie on that that chenille on the back and in your eyes. Um, you know, in the um, sorry, in the crystal flash, wrap it forward, tie it off, and you're good. So that's all there is to it. So I'll pull this out. It's easier to see how this fly looks when you pull it out of the vise. I think it looks incredibly shrimpy, um, but it also just looks like a good little crustacean. So give it a try and uh, and let me know how it works. You know, it's always neat to use a fly that was designed for one specific place in a different place. You know, the fish may not have seen this before. You know, they may have seen a thousand clousers, um, but uh, never anything like this. And so then I say, oh, well, let me try to eat that instead. And, and it might work out really well for you. So uh, with that, um, you know, I'll go ahead and, and stop the live stream. But, you know, you guys know you can, uh, for, for those of you who don't have my email or anything like that, um, you can leave a comment and ask questions. Or for those of you who weren't able to watch during the live stream, um, you know, or for those of you who have my contact information, shoot me a, a message and, you know, let me know how it goes. Send me pictures. And also, uh, if you have any questions on how it works, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, answer as best as I can. So, all right. Take care and have a nice night.